I have to say, I feel like a rock star. This is amazing. Wow, so many wonderful humans out there. Not so uh, skeptical now, are we, about psychology? Love life and enjoy every moment. Oh, wow, hello. I have to say, I feel like a rock star. This is amazing. Big crowd. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the importance of self-compassion and how it's a really important alternative to self-esteem. So let me tell you a little bit about how I got so interested in self-compassion to the point where really now it's my life's work. Um, I didn't invent the idea. Uh, actually, I learned about self-compassion uh, my last year of graduate school at University of California at Berkeley. And basically, to be honest, my life was a mess. I was a basket case. I had gotten out of a messy divorce. I was feeling a lot of shame. I was having a lot of insecurity. What am I going to do with my life? Um, a lot of stress about finishing my PhD. Not so much would I finish it, but would I get a job after finishing it? And so um, I thought I would learn mindfulness meditation as a way to deal with my stress, because I had heard that mindfulness was um, good for stress. And so the very first night I went to the meditation group, the woman leading the class talked about the importance of having compassion not only for others, but for yourself, about how we could actually support ourselves, be kind to ourselves, care for ourselves when we are struggling. So I started making that little shift in orientation toward myself, trying to be kinder and more supportive during this stressful time I was experiencing. And I was amazed at what a difference it made. Um, so really, just to say, for me, although I do do research on self-compassion, it's really something I know from my personal life. And I'll just tell you a little bit, one of the biggest reason I'm so convinced that self-compassion is a, a strength that's worth cultivating it was about uh, 14 years ago, my son Roland was diagnosed with autism. And it was definitely the biggest challenge I had faced in my life so far. Uh, but luckily, I had my self-compassion practice. So I knew that when something big like this comes up, that my task was, first of all, to acknowledge how hard this was, to turn toward myself, to give myself permission to be there for myself during this painful time, to fully accept all my feelings. Um, I'm sure there are some other special needs parents in this audience here. And you know that when something like this happens, you have feelings you think you aren't supposed to have, right? Feelings like disappointment, you know, fear, a little bit of irrational shame, is it something I did? But I knew that if I could just allow myself to feel whatever it was I was feeling and support myself and be there for myself, they would, I, would able to, I would be able to um, support and be there for my son more effectively, which was the case. So um, again, this is really just to say this comes, from, comes a little bit from my head, but my passion about self-compassion mainly comes from my heart and my own life experience. Okay, so... Um, Turns out I, I did get a job, actually, after getting my PhD. I did uh, two years of postdoctoral study with one of um, the United States' leading self-esteem researchers named Susan Harder. So that's how I got also interested in self-esteem. So I'm going to talk a little bit about self-esteem before talking about self-compassion. So what is self-esteem? Um, the way I'm defining it here is basically a global evaluation of self-worth a judgment that I am a really great person, I'm a so-so person, or I'm a bad person, okay? And certainly in the United States, I expect it was the same in Australia as well, for a while, psychology was crazy about self-esteem. There were um, literally thousands of books written about the importance of self-esteem. And if you're wondering, that, yes, that does say The Complete Idiot's Guide to Self-Esteem. Right? Um, and the reason psychology was so in love with self-esteem is there was a lot of research showing that people who felt good about themselves, who judged themselves positively, they had good mental health, whereas people who hated themselves, who thought that they were worthless, they tended to be um, depressed, anxious, and in the worst case, maybe even consider committing suicide. So psychology really thought that um, self-esteem was the answer to all our problems. 
Uh, however, there was a backlash against self-esteem in psychology because uh, researchers started realizing that self-esteem was actually not all it's cracked up to be. Okay, so there are a lot of potential problems with self-esteem. The problem isn't so much whether you have it or not have it. The problem is how do you get your self-esteem? There are more healthy ways and a lot of unhealthy ways people get their self-esteem. By the way, I don't know if Roy Baumeister is here, but I just have to give a shout out for him. He was the most, one of the most influential American psychologists for really exposing the, a potential dark side of self-esteem. One of the problems with self-esteem is that in order to have it, we need to be special and above average. I mean, think about it. Think about it. If someone told you that something you really valued, like your work performance or you know, your ability as a friend or maybe a lover, that you are average, ouch. You know, it's not OK to be average. So the problem is, is we all have to be above average to feel good about ourselves. But what that means is self-esteem is predicated on a logical impossibility because we can't all be above average at the same time. So it sets up this really um, unhealthy dynamic where we are constantly comparing ourselves to others. You know, is that person better than me? Am I better than them? And that, that social comparison dynamic actually leads to some pretty nasty behavior. Uh, for instance, we know that the reason early adolescents start to bully other kids that's the quest for high self-esteem. They don't have much to base their self-worth on, so they do it by being bigger or stronger or being able to pick on other kids, okay? So this is actually an unhealthy dynamic. Um, another unhealthy <laughs> effect of self-esteem is a narcissism. In fact, in the United States, because of the big emphasis on um, self-esteem in the schools, we had a whole generation of narcissists. And if you've ever um, been in a relationship with a narcissist or you have the misfortune to have one as your president, I don't need to tell you the problems with narcissism. You know, this kind of ego defensive, um, you can't threaten me, you can't question me, and if you do, I'm gonna attack you in some way. This type of narcissistic behavior is very um, unhealthy, and yet it comes directly from that need to feel good about ourselves, to have high self-esteem. Um, another problem with self-esteem, and this, this um, plagues a lot of our young people today, but really people of all ages, is perfectionism. People really feel they've got to get it perfect, they've got to get it right to feel good about themselves. And if they, you know, get an A minus or, you know, God forbid, a B plus, or they don't get it exactly perfect, they feel horrible about themselves. And a lot of stress, especially for our young people today, comes from this need, this desire to be perfect. And of course, um, perfection is impossible, right? So it causes a lot of unnecessary stress. Uh, one of the biggest problems with self-esteem is that it tends to be contingent. In other words, we have it when we succeed in some area, but it deserts us when we fail, or at least do you know, a below average. So actually, we know from the research the three most um, important areas in which we invest our self-esteem is social approval, how much do other people like us, um, perceived attractiveness, and a success, success at business, athletics, whatever it is you want to be good at. Um, and for women, this is probably not going to surprise you, um, perceived attractiveness is the most important domain in which women invest their self-esteem. Sadly, it doesn't matter whether you have a PhD or not, there's just a tremendous social pressure for women um, to be attractive. And because of the fact that it's contingent, in other words, we have to succeed to feel good about ourselves, our self-esteem tends to be unstable. In other words, on a good day, we may have high self-esteem, but the moment anything goes wrong, our self-esteem plummets. And some psychologists actually argue that more important than how high your self-esteem is, is how stable your self-esteem is. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little story, sadly it is a true story, of a time when um, my self-esteem skyrocketed it and plummeted within about three seconds. Okay, so here's the story. I was with a, um, a group of friends, maybe about seven friends, and we were visiting an equestrian center, a riding stables. And we, we walk up to the stables, and there's, there's this little old Spanish riding instructor, maybe about 70 or 80 years old. We walk up, and I, I guess he liked my slightly Mediterranean looks, and he said, 
you are very beautiful. In front of my friends, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Don't ever shave your moustache. <laughs> yeah, it's a true story. So <laughs> go from the top of the world to feeling like, oh my God, in one second, right? So self-esteem is not stable. It's there for us one minute, but it deserts us in the, in the next. Right when we need it, our self-esteem deserts us. So you might say it's a fair weather friend. Okay, and so the problem with this is basically self-esteem can't really help us feel good about ourselves or have a good relationship with ourselves because it's so unstable, because it's so contingent, because there's always someone else doing it better, which means the end result is feelings of inadequacy. Okay, so it was while I was doing all this research on self-esteem as a, as a postdoc and um, you know, practicing self-compassion in my personal life, that I realized uh, self-compassion is the perfect alternative to self-esteem because it's a way to feel good about ourselves that isn't contingent and doesn't require being better than others or being perfect. So let me explain a little bit um, what self-compassion is. Uh, and this is my model of self-compassion. Other people define it differently. But the way I define self-compassion in its most simple terms, the kind of the one that's easiest to understand, is treating yourself with the same kindness, care, understanding that you would show to a close friend, okay? And so if you think about it, we're often at our best with our close friends. By the way, we aren't always at our best with strangers or out-group out members or our nearest and dearest, but usually most of us have really good friends that we care about, and when they come to us and they're struggling in some way, we know how to be supportive, we know how to be understanding, we know how to help them through a difficult time. So basically what self-compassion is, is treating ourselves the same way when we're struggling. Okay, so that's a more informal definition of self-compassion. But um, when I decided, um, I, I did get a real job at, at University of Texas at Austin, and I decided I wanted to uh, do research on self-compassion. So I came up with a more op a formal operational definition, and I created a scale to measure it. Uh, and again, so from my point of view, self-compassion entails three main elements that all have to be there in order for it to be true self-compassion. And that is a mindfulness, common humanity, and kindness. And I'll just explain each of these a little bit more. So th there's been a lot of talk about mindfulness. I'm sure most of you have had some exposure um, to it. It's really considered um, key to psychological well-being. Mindfulness is also key to self-compassion. You can't actually have self-compassion without mindfulness. So what mindfulness does it, is it um, helps us become aware that we're struggling. Now, normally when we struggle, we're lost in it, in a process I call over-identification. We're lost in the storyline. You know, this is the worst thing that's happened, or I'm the worst person ever. Mindfulness gives us that little bit of space to where we step outside of ourselves, and we say, wow, you're really hurting right now. You're, ha you're having a hard time. Again, just like we might be able to see it more easily with a friend. Um, so mindfulness is a, a way of turning toward our suffering, something which we don't like to do, but turning toward it in a kind of balanced way, all right? And then once we turn toward the fact that we're struggling or feeling inadequate, we respond with kindness as, a bo as opposed to harsh self-judgment, okay? So we kind of are understanding to ourselves, we're supportive, we're kind. Um, now this is ideally the response, but actually, most of us, if you actually look at the research, the numbers, most of us tend to be judgmental and, and, and cruel to ourselves, when we f especially when our suffering comes from failure or making a mistake, feeling inadequate. Um, in fact, the golden rule says, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and that's great, but please, do not do unto others as you do unto yourself, because you will have no friends, right? So if you actually look at this, we know from the research that people are often more harsh, really cruel with themselves. They say things to themselves that they would never say to anyone else, especially someone they cared about. So self-compassion turns that around, and we start cultivating a kinder, more um, understanding stance toward ourselves. 
Um, also, just to say, there's an action element to self-compassion. We know compassion in general, um, it, it taps into the desire to alleviate suffering. And we know from brain scans that when you're feeling compassion, the motor cortex gets activated. So there's this desire to step in and help in some way. So for others or for ourselves. And then finally, this is, you know, I didn't actually realize at first that I had to have common humanity, my definition of self-compassion, but I was reading a lot about, um, especially in the Buddhist literature, the fact that um, the near enemy of compassion is pity. And I was very concerned with what's the difference between self-compassion and self-pity, because we know um, self-pity is not a healthy mind state. So the difference between self-compassion and self-pity is recognition of common humanity, okay? So part of, and actually the, the word compassion, the Latin means compassion, suffer with. There's an inherent connectedness to the feeling of self-compassion. So what that means is when we fail or we make a mistake or something really difficult happens, we remember that Everyone is imperfect, makes mistakes, and everyone lives an imperfect life. Everyone struggles. Now, this may be, seem obvious. You know, if I were to ask you, can you nominate anyone alive today who's absolutely perfect or lives a perfect life? And of course not, you can't. But what happens, especially in that moment when we fail or we do something wrong or we're feeling bad about ourselves or we get that call from the doctor, in that moment, we react as if something has gone wrong. You know, this shouldn't be happening. As if what should be happening, what's normal, is everything is perfect, and when things aren't perfect, something has gone terribly wrong. And that feeling um, makes us feel isolated, it makes us feel abnormal, and we feel cut off from the rest of humanity in those moments. And it really, we're adding insult to injury because not only are we struggling, we feel all alone in our struggle. So with self-compassion, we turn that around, we remember that, hey, life is difficult for everyone. Um, and again, let me tell you a little story. I like to tell stories to illustrate how this plays out. Um, I remember once being with Rowan, it was about, he was about five years old, and we were at the park, and there were other parents with their children at the park, and you know, all the other kids were playing and laughing and interacting and playing with their parents, and they seemingly were having this wonderful time. And here was Rowan, he was about five at the time, stimming away on the top of the slide, banging the slide. He was very autistic at that point, um, not interacting with me, not interacting with other children. Um, and I'll be honest, I started to go down that rabbit hole of self-pity. You know, why me? Why can't I have a normal, perfectly happy, unproblematic relationship with my child like all these other parents? You know, but I caught myself because I've been doing a lot of self-compassion practice and I said, Kristen, really? You're assuming that all these other parents have and will continue to have a perfectly normal, unproblematic relationship with their kids? I mean, yeah, maybe it's not autism, but it could be some other mental health challenge, a physical challenge, or at the very least, there's sure to be conflict and struggle in their relationship with their kids, and that in fact, what defines being a parent is we struggle with our children, we have challenges, and we do our best, and we love them anyway which is what I was trying to do. So the second I made that reframe and I remembered common humanity, I went from feeling totally alone and isolated on the playground to feeling really connected to all those other parents that were there with me. And so that's one of the powerful things self-compassion gives you, is in a moment of struggle or difficulty, instead of feeling isolated, we can actually feel connected to the rest of humanity. Um, so I need to make this point about self-compassion, because a lot of people get confused here. There is both um, a yin and a yang element to self-compassion. So the yin element of self-compassion involves being with ourselves in a kind way, kind of soothing, comforting, validating ourselves. And if you want to feel what that feels like, you can maybe put your hand on your chest, right, and kind of that sense of, being here, being with ourselves, um, being kind, being supportive. But people often forget that there is also a yang, an action element to self-compassion that involves acting in the world, protecting, 
providing, uh, motivating ourselves to make needed changes, right? So if you think about um, the prototypical um, yang element, you may think of a mother comforting and soothing her crying child, but it's just as compassionate, the prototypical father who works two jobs to put bread on his table for his children, or a fireman who goes into a burning building and risking his own life to save people in danger. That's equally compassionate. And to feel kind of what the yang um, element of compassion feels like, which sometimes involves um, protecting people, kind of that mama bear protective energy. We're going to do this together. Sometimes com self-compassion feels like, no! Let's all do that together three times. No! 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 <laughs> you can feel it, right? It feels energizing. You know, self-compassion is not just um, being complacent and allowing things to be as they are. Sometimes self-compassion says, I gotta make a change. I'm harming myself or I'm harming someone else. I need to do something about it. So again, self-compassion is concerned with the alleviation of suffering and often that means uh, taking action. So just let me briefly talk about the research on self-compassion. It's, it's really exploding. You know, back in 2003, I, I wrote the first article defining and measuring self-compassion. And now there are well over 1,500 studies on self-compassion. So it's an exploding field of study. Um, and the bottom line is self-compassion is really strongly linked to well-being. So we know that people who are more self-compassionate or who are put in a self-compassionate mood or who are trained to be more self-compassionate, they have better well-being. They're less, um, they've got less negative mind states, less depression, anxiety, um, shame, stress, you name it, uh, less um, problems with body image, et cetera. At the same time, people who are more self-compassionate ex experience more positive states of being. You know, they're happier, they're more hopeful, they're more optimistic, they can appreciate their bodies. There's even some evidence that it helps um, healthy immune function, okay? And it's a little unusual for a single psychological construct to be so positively linked to good things and so strongly negatively linked to bad things. Uh, and that's because I think there's something special about self-compassion, the experience of self-compassion, that explains, is explained when we, when we describe the three components of self-compassion, kindness, mindfulness, common humanity, as loving, connected presence. Right, when you say those words, you can kind of feel what that evokes. When we are in a state of self-compassion, we are in a state of loving, connected presence. And so when we embrace our struggle or our feelings of inadequacy or our pain in loving, connected presence, it helps reduce the pain, it helps us cope, at the same time that this is a very positive emotion. So there's a real alchemy to self-compassion. Again, we don't get rid of the pain, we're still as imperfect as ever, but by holding ourselves in the midst of our struggle with loving, connected presence, it gives us the strength to thrive. Okay, so um, we have done a lot of research comparing self-compassion um, and self-esteem. Again, this is either with self-report scales or with experimental methods. Um, and we know that you know, self-compassion, like self-esteem, is linked to positive mental health, but it has fewer pitfalls. So um, you know, self-compassion isn't linked to social comparison. You don't have to be better than anyone else to be self-compassionate. You just have to be a flawed human being like everyone else. You know, I can do that. Check that box. That one's possible, right? So um, that's a good thing. Uh, there's no association with narcissism. Um, it doesn't lead to maladaptive perfectionism the way self-esteem does. Um, and the sense of self-worth is much more stable over time than self-esteem because it's not contingent on success. In other words, self-compassion self steps in precisely when self-esteem fails us, and that's when we are, you know, feel inadequate or aren't doing our best. I um, just have to mention, there are some myths about self-compassion, some very powerful myths that actually really get in our way um, uh, of us be giving ourselves permission to be self-compassionate. Uh, one, we think that self-compassion is weak. You know, I have to say, I'll just tell you a little story. Um, back in 2011, my a book came out and there was a big New York Times article on my self-compassion research. And I was so naive. And I really thought all the online comments on self-compassion would be positive. 
of course it would be. Self-compassion is the best thing since sliced bread. But uh-uh, about half of them were really negative. And I remember one comment stands out. The comment was, oh, great, just what we need, a nation of sissies. <laughs> right? So a lot of people think that self-compassion is for sissies, that it's a weakness. Um, we know from the research that actually the number one reason people, they could actually be afraid of being self-compassionate is they think it will make them lose their edge, that it'll undermine their motivation. Um, another common fear is that it's going to lead to self-indulgence, right? That if I don't have the whip, I'm going to be lazy, I'm just going to sit around eating bonbons all day. Um, and then finally, this is a very big fear, and I have to say, this one um, strikes women especially, the fear that it's selfish, right? Aren't we supposed to be compassionate toward others? It feels really kind of odd to turn this lens of compassion on ourselves. It feels selfish, like we shouldn't do it. Uh, luckily, now, there's a lot of research showing it ain't so, okay? So what we know from the research, the reality of self-compassion is first of all, it is not weak, it is not weak. It is one of the most powerful sources of strength, coping, and resilience we have available to us. So people who go through a really hard time, we've looked at people going through a divorce or people with chronic pain, um, looked at parents of autistic children. One study we looked at, we looked at veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and we measured their levels of self-compassion, and then we followed up nine months later to see who was it who developed post-traumatic stress syndrome. And we found that self-compassion was a powerful predictor of PTSD. In other words, those soldiers who could be kind and supportive to themselves were much less likely to develop PTSD. And in fact, their self-compassion level was more powerful than the level of action they saw overseas. Okay, so in other words, it's not just what you experience in life, it's how do you relate to yourself when things are difficult? Are you an inner ally? Do you have your own back? Are you an inner enemy? Are you constantly c uh, cutting yourself down, shaming yourself? Clearly, being supportive is gonna give you more strength to survive and meet life's challenges than cutting yourself down all the time. Um, a lot of research now showing that self-compassion increases motivation. It doesn't undermine it, right? So we know, first of all, one of the, the strengths self-compassion gives you is it makes you less afraid of failure. You know you can take a, a risk, and if you fail, you will still accept yourself. And fear of failure is actually one of the biggest reasons why we aren't motivated to achieve. So self-compassion makes us less afraid of failure. We have uh, less performance anxiety. When we do fail, we're more likely to pick ourselves up again, try again, and keep trying. Um, it's not linked to self-indulgence, just the opposite. Self-compassionate people, they take better care of themselves, they exercise more, they go to the doctor more often, uh, they're more likely to practice safe sex. Again, you know, a, an example would be like a, a parent who cares about their child, they aren't gonna indulge their child and let them eat whatever they want and stay up all night, right? A caring parent says, no, you gotta eat your vegetables, you gotta go to bed on time because I care about you and I want you to be well. The same thing with ourselves. Um, and then finally, a, a big fear of self-compassion is again, again that, it, that it's selfish. What we know from the research is self-compassion really enhances interpersonal relationships. Um, in fact, I don't know if uh, any of you maybe are on the dating market, maybe you're signed up with one of these online dating programs and you're deciding who to meet for coffee. I have a tip. Send your potential coffee mate to my website, www.selfcompassion.org. Have them take my self-compassion scale and get their score. Before you meet for coffee, get their score. Because what we know is that people who score higher in self-compassion are described by their partners as being more caring, more intimate, more loving, less controlling. They tend to compromise more often. So in other words, um, when you give yourself what you need, when you give yourself this resource of kindness and, and support and understanding, you actually have more to give to others. Um, there's another reason that I've, I've really seen in my personal life for, for why self-compassion is not selfish. And um, that's partly the way uh, the human brain is constructed, okay? 
So um, the human brain is largely designed for the ability to empathetically resonate with the emotions of others. We have a specialized neur uh, neurons called mirror neurons that help us just read the emotions of others. A large part of the real estate of the brain is actually devoted to feeling what other people are feeling. Okay, so what does this mean? That means that the mental state that we cultivate is picked up on by others. So think about it, you know, if you're going or walking around feeling inadequate, feeling full of shame, feeling like you hate yourself, every single person you come in contact with is feeling that, they're feeling that shame, they're feeling that frustration. But when you walk around in a state of loving, connected presence, other people are able to feel your loving, connected presence, and it helps them as well, okay? So basically, um, our state of mind impacts everyone we come into contact with. And again, I'm gonna tell another Rowan story. This is how I, <laughs> I really know that this works, because um, you know some people say autistic people, they, they lack the ability to empathetically resonate with others. That's not the case with Rowan. He was always very, very sensitive. And I remember often what would happen, especially when he was younger, you know, one of the issues with autism is very um, sensitive to sensory input, and he would tantrum at the drop of a hat for no discernible reason. And I remember one time, actually, I was on an airplane with him. We were, we were doing an overseas flight, and it was that point in the flight when they turn the lights down, you know, and everyone's hoping to get a little sleep, and for some reason, that change in the lighting set Rowan off, okay? And he went into a full-on, screaming, flailing tantrum on the plane. He's about five years old at the time, big kid, and what it felt like to me is every person in the plane was going, oh my God, why can't that mother control her kid? What's wrong with that kid? I mean, they were actually probably more compassionate than I realized, but that was what was going through my mind. And I felt really bad also. I was disturbing all these people. They wanted to sleep. So I thought, okay, what am I gonna do? What are my options? Um, what are my options? I know, I have a brilliant idea. I'll take him to the bathroom, and we'll go in there, I'll let him tantrum in there, and maybe it'll muffle his cries. Okay, so imagine me going down the aisle of the plane, you know, kid flailing, screaming, tantruming, excuse me, sorry, autistic, uh, coming through. We get to uh, the, the little space outside the toilet, which was, of course, occupied, because the lesson life was wanting to teach me was not like how to avoid the tantrum, it was how to cope with the tantrum. So we're outside this little space in the bathroom, and you know, I had no options. I had no options. There was nothing I could do. There was nothing I could do to control Rowan or to control the situation. But what I did have was my self-compassion practice. Right? So what I did is I, I made sure Warren was safe and you know, that he wasn't harming himself, but I spent about 95% of my energy on myself. I you know, soothed and comforted myself. You know, I'm so sorry, darling, this is so hard for you. I'm here for you. I, mean, I didn't say that out loud. It looked bad enough that I was rocking and holding my chest, but I didn't really care. You know? I was just really rocking and holding my chest. I'm so sorry. Um, and then what happened, not only did it give me the ability to cope, I noticed that as soon as I was able to calm myself down, Rowan calmed down. And I saw this over and over again in our relationship. You know, let's face it, some days I wasn't able to do that. Some days I would feel frustrated or I'd blame myself. Is it something I did? You know, I forgot to give him protein that morning. That must be it. And when I started self-blaming or getting agitated, Rowan would ramp up. Right, he would get more extreme in his behavior. But the more I could calm and soothe myself, again, um, embody the state of loving, connected presence, the more Rowan would feel it, okay? So really, I, especially for, for caregivers, people who think it's selfish to be um, self-compassionate, uh, it's really not. It's actually one of the kindest things you can do for other people. So um, I'm actually going to, we only have a few minutes, I'm just going to give you a little taste of what it may feel like to um, be compassionate to yourself in a moment of struggle. This is a little practice called the self-compassion break, which you can actually do. Um, if you're feeling like it, you, don't, you can also just take a little snooze if you don't want to do this practice. But I'd invite everyone actually just to close your eyes for a moment. It's not really meditation, it's just a little exercise. 
Okay. And see if you can think of something that's going on in your life right now that's causing some distress. Don't, don't think of your most overwhelmingly difficult problem. We just want to touch the pain here. But think of something, maybe a health issue or a relationship issue. All right, something that's bothering you, that's difficult for you. Okay, and so what we're going to be doing is, as we're in touch with this difficulty, and by the way, you should feel some stress in your body as you, as you think about this, but not overwhelmingly so. So I'm going to be saying some words that are actually designed to evoke the three components of self-compassion, right? And I'd like you just to kind of let them drop into your awareness. The first phrase is, this is a moment of struggle, of difficulty, right? What you're going through right now, the situation, this is hard. So we're just bringing mindful awareness to the fact that we're struggling. But also we want to remember that, you know, struggle, difficulty, this is part of being a human being, right? It's not just you, it's not abnormal. This is part of what it means to be human. You aren't alone in what you're going through. So we're reminding ourselves of common humanity. And so because of that, we want to be kind to ourselves, kind, supportive, caring. We want to be able to give ourselves the compassion we need. So maybe if you can think of a few words of kindness to say to yourself, something like, you know, I've got your back, I'm here for you, I care, I'll do what I can to help. Okay, and so you can open your eyes. So um, really you can use these three components of self-compassion whenever you need it. Um, so I just want to leave you with a final message. That the really cool thing about self-compassion practice as opposed to self-esteem the goal of self-compassion practice is simply to be a compassionate mess. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get it right. You can still feel inadequate. You can still make mistakes. But as long as you hold the mess that is you and your life with great compassion, you will actually be able to thrive and be happy. Thank you very much.